Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Piscataquag Room. I don't know about you, but I had a little bit of trouble pronouncing this room initially. I wanted to pronounce it as Pisca Piscataquag, and I was corrected, Piscataquag. Welcome to the current state of charge, electric vehicle charging investments and opportunities for New Hampshire communities. Um, you may not know me, but I've been, oh my gosh, supporting Clean Energy New Hampshire local energy solutions conferences for many years. My name is Jessica Wilcox, and I am a transportation program specialist with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, where I also get to direct the Granite State Clean Cities Coalition. So Clean Cities is part of a nationwide program um, that's supported by the U.S. Department of Energy, and we work with towns, fleets, um, businesses that are interested in moving to clean transportation solutions like electric vehicles which is what I get to talk with you all about today. So I talk a lot about strategies for New Hampshire communities that are interested in transitioning to electric vehicles or at least getting ready for electric vehicles and today what I really wanted to do is I want to open with a quick level setting exercise and do a quick like EV 101 or electric vehicle 101 but then I'm gonna turn it over to some very special presenters who are actually in towns that have done projects where they've installed electric vehicle charging stations. So these folks have gone through all those steps, talked with those, pulled together those teams, and navigated some of the challenges and obstacles that I think we face here in our state as we're trying to grow EV charging infrastructure to prepare for all these vehicles that are coming, right? As of April of this year, 4.6 million electric vehicles registered in on the roads in our nation. And that grew by leaps and bounds in a very short amount of time. So even our grid operator, ISO New England, is projecting for a million electric vehicles in our region in the next several years. So we got to get ready and there's some work we got to do. So before I get too far into the abbreviations or acronyms, I just want to touch on the fact that electric vehicles are commonly nicknamed EVs, right? You, everybody's familiar with that? And EV charging infrastructure, also known as electric vehicle supply equipment or EVSE, if you hear those terms thrown around, that's what I'm talking about. It's the same, you know, nickname for, for the same uh, information. So real quick, two types of electric vehicles, right? The all battery electric vehicle, which does not have an engine, runs solely on a battery pack that powers an electric, one or two electric motors. And then the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So this also plugs in, not like a standard hybrid, but it has both a battery and a gas engine. So when the battery charge runs out, you may be running down the road on battery, it seamlessly switches over to the gas engine. Um, the beauty of battery electric vehicles is that their, their range has grown. We've seen back when I first was doing this presentation, I think the, the starting range was like 20 miles, and now we're at 110 at the low end, up to 520 miles of range. Um, with plug-in hybrids, 20 to 126 miles of range, but once again, you have that gas engine to kind of fall back on. Mainstream automakers, right? They're transitioning, huge commitments coming through for electric vehicles. Um, we've got an F-150 Lightning coming today, an E-350 cargo van that are all electric. We're starting to see favorite and familiar vehicles becoming electrified. And that market's growing. We're starting to see this transition into the medium and heavy duty. In fact, we're, we're working on an electric school bus demonstration project. We're trying to get an, a BYD electric school bus for a couple of communities here in our state to, to, um, to try out. So three different, ve electric vehicles are basically fueled by electricity, right? So there's three different types of charging. Level one is basically, it comes with the vehicle. It looks just like this and plugs into your standard three-prong plug. This gives you about three to five miles of range for every hour, so not really great. Level two, which is what we recommend for New Hampshire communities because it invites the EV driver to park, stop, charge, shop, right? It requires basically a dryer plug and can give you between um, 20 to 35 miles of range for every hour of charging. And then there's level three, and that's what all that federal funding and even the Volkswagen funding is really geared towards, is level three or direct current fast charging. Not so great for communities because generally the EV driver is going to plug in, charge up quick, maybe 20 or, or 30 minutes to get that 80% back of range, and then move on. So not as great for communities where you want to invite somebody to come in and walk around. The thing about DC fast chargers is that they have three different connector types. 
Now we're starting to see this transition to this SAE combined charging system. The federal funding that's coming through is really trying to standardize the use of the CCS connector. But Nissan LEAF is still clinging to the Chatamo connector, which is a little bit of a different type and currently only used by the Nissan LEAF. So we're thinking that once Nissan's next model comes out, that they'll probably drop the Chatamo because there is really this push to standardize the, the connectors. And then Tesla, as everybody knows, uses their own unique charging port that's specific. Only Teslas can use it, although there is some discussion about wanting to open up that network, so stay tuned for more information on that. Currently in New Hampshire, level two EV infrastructure, um, 128 charging stations. But when you look at what our neighbors have in their states, we're a little bit behind, right? We've got some work to do, and this is why I say level two is really an opportunity for New Hampshire communities. And as you can see, we have the donut hole up here in the North Country, right? Most of our level two charging is down here in, in southern, southern New Hampshire, but the co-op actually has one way up in Colebrook, right? Level two, level two is up in Colebrook. So thank you for your good work, Gary LeMay. With direct current fast charging infrastructure, we currently have 17 station locations in the state. But once again, look at what our neighboring states have. And ultimately, my point here is states all around us are signed on to California's zero emission vehicle mandate. They're getting electric vehicles, and those vehicles, as we know, come to our state. A lot of uh, tourism and visitors coming from surrounding states. So we really don't want to be left behind when it comes to you know, where the infrastructure is, because EV drivers are looking for that next stop to charge up. So we want to make sure there's, stop, there's places for them to charge. Everybody's familiar with the Volkswagen funding. Our state received approximately 31 million of this funding from the Volkswagen settlement. And the full 15% of that funding was dedicated to EV charging infrastructure by our governor. So we had about 4.6 million available for that. We had an RFP that closed earlier this year. NHDES is the lead agency, so the Department of Environmental Services where my, my program is housed. We received 30 proposals from 14 different applicants for 53 proposed sites. Now, ultimately what happens is you have to look at those and say which ones meet the minimum qualifications of this request for proposals, of this funding opportunity. So when, we, when you looked at eligibility requirements, about 43 of those options actually met um, the minimum qualifications. And that represented 35 sites across 25 different New Hampshire towns and cities. So those were basically evaluated by a scoring committee and once they are contracted and those contracts are approved by our governor and council, information about those will be released. So stay tuned for more on that. But ultimately what this funding opportunity was, was looking at was building out fast charging infrastructure along several of what are called our federally designated EV corridors. So these are, this is the list of corridors that was selected. We have many that have been designated by federal highways. Um, we did some legwork there to kind of prepare for that. But Ultimately, these sites would require a minimum of 50 kilowatt fast chargers, um, a minimum of two that are networked and have co-located level two. So basically what we're looking at is a site with a couple of 50, minimum 50 kilowatt DC fast chargers with that level two to accommodate for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, which can't charge on the fast chargers. There's a lot of plug-in hybrids around our state because those work really well when there's not a lot of charging available, right? So here's the full list of federally designated corridors. You, can, you guys can check it out, you'll get a copy of this. I wanna breeze through some of these next slides. So the NEVI program, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, this is funded by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the BIL or Infrastructure Investment and Job Act, the IIJA, same thing, we got a lot of nicknames in the government. So um, ultimately the goal of this program is to get a half a million EV chargers across the nation, so creating this nationwide network and supporting 50% of EV sales by 2030. So we've got some work to do over the next several years, but this is gonna come fast and furious. Our state, from this one billion that's been dedicated to NEVI, our state's getting about 17 million to spend over five years. The New Hampshire Department of Transportation is the lead agency for that funding. So DES for Volkswagen, DOT for NEVI. Now ultimately, <coughs> Ultimately, the Department of Transportation had to develop a deployment plan for the use of this money. And once again, this funding has certain requirements attached to it. So this is gonna require a minimum of four 150 kilowatt chargers per site, does not require any level two, although you could certainly put that in. 
And those chargers have to be capable of simultaneously charging an EV at 150 kilowatts. So we're talking about 600 kilowatt power to these sites. That requires some heavy duty grid infrastructure for these locations. Um, these chargers would once again be focused along those corridors that we talked about. Those, so we're talking about our east-west interstate corridors, our north-south highway corridors. We're not talking about communities, back roads. So there's still this opportunity, right, for our communities to have to install their own charging. And we're going to find some unique ways to fund those projects because a lot of this funding really is directed for fast charging. You can read a little bit more about New Hampshire's plan. I put a link there that you guys will get a copy of the slides. Um, to check it out, but we are looking to, DOT has said that they were, they're looking to implement this plan within that five-year funding cycle. So like I said, a lot's going to be happening in the next several years. There's going to be some opportunities for public engagement, so I do urge you all to check out the NEVI plan for the state of New Hampshire. Check out the NEVI guidance from Federal Highways and get yourself ready to, to talk to DOT or to submit comments to DOT about where you would like to see these chargers. There may even be a map that's released that allows you to drop pins if you want to select a location where you'd like to see charging. Because ultimately, once the money is spent on building out our corridors, there, and if there's any remaining, that funding could be used for other charging, whether level two or fast, on, and not on our corridor. So maybe there is, if there's any funding remaining, the possibility that a community could get some charging if they have a really great site. But that's not guaranteed. I think that's what I kind of want to impress. Yes, this money is coming fast and furious, and yes, it holds a lot of opportunities, but you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get spent real fast. There's a lot of demand for this funding, and those fast charging stations are quite expensive. So there's, there's an opportunity, I think, for communities in the interim to really take a step forward and focus on level two, level two charging build out to invite EV drivers into your community and benefit from the economic outcome of that. So within the NEVI program, there's, there's additional funding for what's called the discretionary grant program. And this will get broken down into two smaller programs more corridor charging, so once again focusing on those designated corridors, but also some community charging. So about 1.25 billion will become available nationwide for community charging, but a huge focus on disadvantaged areas and a, and a huge focus on, you know, com these communities are gonna be in demanding a lot of this funding. So I, I just, I, I caution anybody to hold out for funding coming from the federal infrastructure bill because I, I just think there's going to be a lot of demand for it and there's a lot of priority areas that are going to get fed first before that funding goes anywhere else. So what can you do, as I mentioned, get educated, read the NEVI plan, there's a lot of, you know, interesting resources out there, get engaged, you know, public comments coming in and even engaging, going for ride and drive, showing that there's interest in our state for electric vehicles, and then getting your community EV ready. And we're gonna hear a little bit about that more today. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that I didn't eat up too much of the time here, but I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first uh, set of speakers with the town of Peterborough. We have Seth McLean, who is the assistant town administrator, joined by energy committee members, Emily Manns, who's the chair of the energy committee in Peterborough, and Bruce Tucker as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to you guys, and there is a, um, a live mic on your table if you want to. I'm a loud talker, but for the sake of the camera, we'll, we'll, we'll use the microphone anyway. So you already have your first takeaway, which is Jessica has incredible energy, works for the state of New Hampshire, and was absolutely instrumental in helping us with our project early on. There's another member in the audience, too. I'm not sure I'm allowed to point him out, so I'll wait until after to, to do that. Uh, but if you haven't met Jessica and you haven't engaged with her, the same enthusiasm you just heard for the work she's doing for the state, she brings in one-on-one -on -one conversations and absolutely was instrumental, like I said, in our project, Can, helping us connect the dots. I would highly encourage you to reach out to her. So here I am paying a debt back for all the work she helped us with in connecting the dots. Uh, I have one more. I'm done in November, but yes, paying a debt. So my name is Seth McLean. I work for the town of Peterborough. I wear two hats, three actually, with the town of Peterborough. I'm the assistant uh, town administrator. I'm also the public works director, uh, and I'm sort of the capital projects manager. So in all three capacities, I got involved with this project about midstream. And I, and as I'll go through the presentation, you'll hear a little bit more about my very minimal role in this, but uh, a, a role that's obviously critical if you're working for a town, city, or if you're on a board or committee and you need to work with municipal officials. Um, Hopefully we've got some tricks and some tips and things we can help you with that helped us through our process. 
and that's sort of the point of the majority of our, of our presentation. Uh, today we got Bruce Tucker with us as well. Uh, he is a Peterborough resident, at least part-time. Full-time now, okay, all right. Um, maybe I confused that. And an EV driver since 2000 and 2002. So, so he's a long-term commitment to, to this incredible technology and this important technology. And Emily Mans is with us as well today. She is a big-time member of our, uh, our PEC, our Peterborough Energy Committee. She wears multiple hats. Uh, she also works in the energy field. Uh, and you may find it's another person you might want to engage with as you move forward in your project. So quickly, just so I lay the land, because we weren't really sure what we were walking into here today. How many of you are with towns and cities or on boards and committees and are trying to get a project up off the ground? We have one hand, two, okay, a bunch, great, cool. So that's really, you know, a lot of our, our presentations geared towards you folks. Uh, vendors, people that are, you might want to talk to about, there you go. <clears throat> and then EV drivers who just think this is really cool stuff and get, there we go, all right. <laughs> So we're going to go over a few things. Um, I, I can't really talk about p public charging in Peterborough without talking about a little bit of a legacy, and that might matter in your community too as you're trying to sell your project. So I'm going to, I won't not bore you with 20 years of detail on all the things that our community's done, but a foundation was laid that helped our project. Uh, we're going to go through a very, very basic project summary because I really think that what you want to hear is how we were able to make the project successful, and by we I mean mostly the PEC. Uh, including identification of key steps, and then a big one, the barriers and solutions, and the big bad bully in the room, demand charges. Pardon, sorry to anyone who works for Eversource in the room, but <clears throat> they are difficult. It, uh, I've got the clicker, so we'll go to the next slide here. Peterborough's history and commitment. So this is important from my perspective because it made my job very easy, and maybe your community's already done some green energy projects, or maybe you're working on a project with a community and you may want to leverage that information and build on things. So Peterborough goes back, oh geez, way before I worked there, I've been there eight years now, probably 15 to 20 at this point, made a commitment to reducing its carbon footprint, where we were still calling it that at the time, uh, installed pellet boilers in all of its facilities, upgraded all of our streetlights to LED, uh, made other improvements to windows, building envelopes. Uh, many of you may have heard about our solar array, which once upon a time was the biggest in the state at one megawatt, which powers our wastewater treatment plant. So there was all this work that had been done over many years that the community, even those who are not as into this type of thing, were starting to accept it, see that there's ways to do these projects without costing you a tremendous amount of money. Peterborough had the great fortune of PUC grants, other outside funding sources that helped us to mitigate some of the costs. Um, and maybe there's not as many of those now, and that might be a challenge for you if you're looking for certain grants and things, but as Jessica said, there are some out there. In any case, it mattered to us because it set a climate in our community that our, our team, I'll say, could really build upon. It made our project a lot easier, and I would advise you, if you can, to leverage the work that's already been done in your community to help, uh, to, to show it as a building block. It's the next step. We all know this is the wave of the future, but it's also the next step in your community. Uh, and you may have done smaller, smaller projects, larger projects, but tie it in, you know, make it part of a bigger picture. Uh, I won't get into too much details about precisely what we installed in our community, because I think that's going to be dependent on what you need to do in your communities or with your project. But for the sake of just understanding uh, what we did, we installed, <coughs> excuse me, uh, two level two charging stations um, I won't, it doesn't even matter who the company was per se at this point, although I did list Charge Lab up here. We put in EV box icons. They are two dual port uh, uh, level two charging stations. Okay, and if you want more details on those, happy to talk after. There's people in the room that are more knowledgeable about those models than me. Uh, from my perspective, I think you, maybe you want to hear more about the project management component. <clears throat> Our process, really briefly, was we interviewed 10 vendors, uh, and by we, I mean the committee fed me most of those vendors. They had done the legwork, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about their, uh, their upfront work that helped my job. Uh, we received eight formal responses to an RFP, and we used a scoring matrix that you've already touched on, a scoring matrix that's pretty typical of communities. I'm sure many of you have used them or been involved with them, but we used a scoring matrix system as well to grade the RFPs that we received against the document that we produced and put out. Uh, and we ended up, I think, with six relatively competitive uh, um, uh, uh, proposals. We selected Charge Lab. That made sense for us. Uh, if you're curious as to why that is the case, probably for the Q&A or after I'll be around, I can talk to you about some of our goals and sort of the details and why that made sense for Peterborough. Just a quick picture. This is what our, our, our charging stations look like. Those are the EV boxes. There's our beautiful paint advised by a member of the audience that I will not name. 
uh, our signage, and in any case, uh, what's important here, as Emily put on the screen for me, a municipal parking lot close to shops, restaurants, and walking trails, and I'll explain a little bit more about why I think that's an important consideration as you're looking for a site for your project. Why was our project successful and some considerations for your public project? In our case, we had project champions willing to do the work and research to define the goals and help avoid pitfalls. And by that, I mean the PEC. So what, at the time, how many members were in the PEC, folks? Do you recall? Five, six, Five, six and a couple of additional members that kind of came and went as they had time or interest. Five or six individuals that spent a better part of two years before I even got involved, maybe, a year and a half. Yeah, yeah. Right, there you go. So the silver linings of COVID, there are few, right? Um, they did a lot of work. They championed the project. They didn't just do the research trying to figure out what made sense for Peterborough. They, Peterborough, they talked to the community too. Some of our members are very influential folks that have been around a long time that knew everybody. They knew who to identify who may be skeptical of this type of project in a, in a community like ours. It's a critically important thing if you have champions in your community to reach out to them and engage with them. In our case, it was an ad hoc committee, so they didn't have to keep minutes. They didn't have to post meetings. I mean, a lot of administrators are afraid of those types of things. In our case, it worked really well. It worked very, very well. They had the time, and they were able to make the time and do it on their schedules and do a lot of research and things that weren't necessarily governed by a board. So the project was scaled to a size that residents could accept, but that also allows for future expansion. In our case, that was critically important. Um, there were, would have certainly been people that would have liked to completely line our entire parking lot and just go full bore into this but there's also gonna be that other side of the coin. We do have folks that are a little bit more conservative about these things, so we felt the better approach was to scale it. Start small, look for the site that would allow you to expand into the future, but let's you know, dip our toe in the water. Municipalities love to go incremental and slow, and you have an opportunity to do that with a project like this if you're doing one in your community. And that worked for us. It helped us to sell the project to folks that maybe weren't as interested in it early on. A true partnership emerged between volunteers and public officials. We we have this, not just this project in our community, we are very fortunate that we have a lot of engaged individuals who care about the community and are willing to work hand in hand with the folks that work for the town. In our case, I really think that one of the biggest takeaways for me was just how well this project ran because of all the work the committee did, how willing they were to support me and the work that I had to do in more of a formal capacity. Uh, and I would, I would implore you to try to find the same yourself. You may run into roadblocks with municipal officials who are a little afraid of new technology or don't want to take on additional maintenance. That's a big one for public works departments. Oh, I don't want more work to do. Don't give me anything else to do. We have enough to do. But if you can find a way to make that partnership work, um, that's going to help your project be very successful. And in our case, it really was. It really worked beautifully. Um, uh, working together hand-in-hand -hand, volunteers and public officials uh, to come up with a program that our community can get behind. The project was depoliticized from the beginning and sold as an economic development initiative and not a revenue source. I think that's critically important as you're getting started. People are going to say, well, what are we going to make on this? We're not trying to make anything on this. We're trying to attract EV drivers to our community to shop, at, shop in our downtown. Perhaps there's money for a municipality to make in the future, but at this point, that's not really our goal. Our goal was we need to be a part of this. Our community is committed to green energy, renewable energies. This is the next step for us, and this is an economic driver. We're going to get on the map. People that otherwise wouldn't visit our community will come to our community, and that was the way that the project was always sold, which actually resulted in rate setting, which was to try and basically just mitigate electricity charges, not try and offset the cost of our chargers or any long-term anything as relates to the operation or maintenance of those. It was simply cover the electricity costs, so we're not giving away free energy or free fuel, because we certainly had that criticism. Um, uh, but again, just get people to our community to see our beautiful downtown and shop at our stores and, and visit our community. Peterborough engaged with outside consultants, uh, some working in formal capacity, some that will not be named, uh, who are in the room, as I keep saying, <laughs> uh, to help us with things like RFP development, uh, site considerations and installation. We didn't go this alone, and I would, I would suggest to you try to find those partners too. There are people that are willing to work with you. There are other communities, Wolfboro and Peterborough, that have done a project now that are happy to advise you. Uh, we'll share our information with you. Uh, certainly catch me offline, send me an email. You'll have my contact information at the end, as with the others on our committee. Uh, Jessica, like I said, is a great resource. Talk to vendors. They're going to be able to help you through this. 
uh, and uh, don't try to go it alone. There's a lot of different ways you can do this and a lot of very intelligent people that can help you. Leverage your resources where you can. In the case of Peterborough, uh, our public works department did most of the installation. We have the ability to do that. We have a good, we are a maintenance organization, but at the same time, we have a lot of staff members who have construction background and excavation background. And they, you know, uh, push back a little bit sometimes when you ask them to work outside of the box, but at the end of the day, they actually really appreciated doing the project because it was outside of the box. And it wasn't more than they could handle. And we saved a lot of money on our installation by keeping it in-house. We were, were already paying our staff, so maybe consider that. You might be able to drive some of your costs down on your project by getting your uh, maybe uh, your public works director to actually agree to help you out on this one. So at the end of the day, go to your city council or board because they can make them do it anyway. Uh, regular updates to key stakeholders. Over communication was critically important. The PEC folks were engaged with one of our select board members the entire time through the project, actually prior to him being on our board and then after. Uh, myself talking to our board, uh, talking to the town administrator, talking to other key staff members. Over, uh, uh, over amount, uh, uh, up, over and above with the information is the best way to go. Take it step by step, talk to everybody, keep everybody engaged. There's a lot of reassuring going on there. Our community's a mix of, uh, for lack of a better term, it's a rural, but sort of has a little bit of an urban vibe to it downtown. And we have a diversity of folks, uh, including folks who have absolutely no interest in green energy and fly big red, white, and blue flags and have very loud diesel trucks that like to run through our downtown. So you gotta talk to them too. You gotta get people to understand where, where we're coming from. So. And I think those are the big reasons why our project was successful. It was team-oriented. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Emily, who will talk to you in more detail about the PEC. So I'm going to stand as well. Um, I'm Emily Manns, and I'm the chair of the Peterborough Energy Committee. And um, part of our uh, mission at the Energy Committee is to build capacity. So part of our building capacity is to make, make ourselves available to other people to share the lessons we learned through this project. And I'd like to say another sort of personal mission is overcoming barriers. So, um, you know, I think that this project, an EV charging facility in town, both builds capacity to show the possibilities for our town, but it also um, teaches us how to um, take one step at a time and, and keep moving forward. Good one. Yep, so. Um, so I have um, a lot of information on the next couple of um, slides that I'm going to go through very quickly, but I guess you're getting a copy of them. Um, really key steps along the way. Um, we worked with the town from the start. There are two ways to work with your town. You can, um, first you invite them to a meeting and you just listen to their priorities. You, if they show up, then you know that they're interested in energy topics and they have time to work with you. Um, and, then, and then you hear their priorities and then you can pitch some things that aren't fully formed. So that's one way to work with them. And then the other way when you're ready is you go and you make an appointment with them and you, and you pitch a project. So um, with Seth's predecessor, we pitched a project for EV charging in a new parking lot. And um, the town manager at the time was, was open to that. And, and uh, so we, we moved quite quickly forward. Um, the site really on renewable energy projects or EV charging projects really is defined by the site. So um, we did look at other sites and we did look at um, uh, you know, level three charging, but we settled on our site as a destination site. It's near our downtown, it's in an attractive location and we're extremely happy with it. Um, but really that's, you know, having conversations amongst yourselves about the topic is less important than finding a site and a host that's suitable. Um, and the, you know, so, we had local funding through the tax increment financing. There's the link. If you don't, if your town doesn't have that, or if you're not sure, educate yourself on that. That's a great way to to marry business and um, and you know renewable energy goals for your town. And then um, uh, and then the launch. Of course, the blast off is the really the most important <laughs> um, step. And uh, we launched in April of of this year. Um, so some challenges and solutions. We uh, pay attention to the town process. We actually, um, so that's very kind, but we missed some key um, meetings. We actually didn't get a unanimous vote on any of the <laughs> levels of government that we needed, um, but we, we made it through and we won't make the same mistakes next time. So they don't come to you and say, you're up on in the select board meeting, they come to you and you know, that you missed the meeting, so you have to pay attention. Um, it's a wild west for equipment. Um, I don't need to say more about that. 
who pays for the electricity was a, what turned out to be the major barrier that we had to go to individuals to address. Um, and ultimately, it's not free. Um, and then the live launch, we, we did a hard launch, which was basically as soon as they were in, we still had our contractor there, you know, kind of problem solving. But the software that the, the units came with was not really very suitable for us. And it took us a, a couple of weeks to work through how we were going to solve it. We thought first instructions through the six steps, and then we ultimately worked with them to change the, the, the customer facing. Um, so now you just use a QR code and you go up there and you basically need a, you need a cell phone or you can go online and sign up or you need a fob. And then, um, and then demand charges. And Bruce, I hope you have a few minutes to talk about demand charges, but I'm just going to show, this is what everybody <laughs> said they wanted to see, which is our dashboard. So you'll see our slide there. We do have some use. We have a little revenue. Um, this is from September. We haven't really pushed use yet, but, um, but I won't dwell here so we can um, like at least hear from Bruce and, uh, to introduce the, about the biggest challenge we had, which was um, solving the demand charges problem. Can everyone hear me? No, a little closer. Now can you hear me? No. <laughs> okay, how about this? Okay. So when I came on board, we were most of the way through the process. Okay. All right. <clears throat> when I came on board, actually I should say, um, I mentioned that I, I've been driving an EV for, since 2002. Um, that means I've been interacting with charging since then, too. And I have to tell you that charging these days is nothing like charging back at the beginning of this century. Okay, maybe I'll just... Uh, how, how's this? All right, all right. Okay, so um, EV charging is a lot different now than it was back in 2006, for example. Um, we have cell phone connections. You can... Um, monetize your charging um, a lot easier. In fact, back then, it was all free. Um, so, the thing that, let me change here. Oh, good. Okay, so what, what we found is that demand charges is a, a real barrier to uh, operating EV chargers. You can get lots of money for installing chargers. You can make that work, but if you're not careful, the way it operates is not economic for towns, and, and Derry found that out. They, they shut down their chargers because it was just costing them too, too much money. So we really looked at what demand charges um, did and how we could um, minimize it. So just quickly, what, what is demand? Demand is how much uh, power you are requesting at any given instant, um, and then power that you request over a period of time um, is your usage, how, how much energy you use. And they're, they're, um, they use different units. The demand is in kilowatts and kilowatt hours for usage. And you have to read your electric bill to make sure you understand what's going on. Now, Peterborough is in um, the Eversource district. And so their rules for demand is if you have a garage, or a house, um, you're good to go because there are no demand charges for residential rates. If, however, you're in an apartment, a condo, a business, a municipality, or a, um, um, a university or school, you have demand charges. And Eversource's rules are you get five kilowatt free, and then Every kilowatt above that in, in demand, you're paying $18.24 um, per kilowatt. So a normal EV charger operating at 32 amps uses 7.7 .7 kilowatt. So right off the bat, you are paying for 2.7 kilowatts, about $50, on top of your customer fee of $16. So. What this does is it means that the power level you choose to operate your EV charger at has a big impact on what that demand charge ends up being each month. 
and it can approach um, $140 um, per month extra. Now, when we were planning our our chargers, we wanted four chargers. So what does that do? That multiplies that by four. So you're looking at almost $500 a month on demand charges and customer fee total. That's hard to make up for in, uh, by just charging, uh, at, uh, making your fee structure pay for, for the energy. So we needed another option. And, and the way we did that was we put every charger on its own meter. That way, we got five kilowatt free for every charger, or 20 free kilowatts. That's a big deal because it, it halved our cost. It went from um, 487, potentially, to 262. That we could handle. Um, so, how do you set what you ask your uh, customers to pay? Well, you generate a table like this, and you look down it, and you say, how much can we add on demand charges to each kilowatt that, that they are using? Can we add 20 cents? Um, well, it used to be that that was about what it cost per kil kilowatt hour. It's a little bit more now. Um, but that's doubling the cost of it. Maybe that's too much. Maybe 10 cents, maybe 5 cents. You have to make a choice, and that is determining, um, what, what determines that a, a possibility is how much charging you have. So, for example, you would need 31 hours of charging to bring demand charges down to tw 20 cents added per kilowatt hour. That's not an insignificant amount, um, but if you want to get down to 10 cents, you need 64 hours. So I think generally we assume that uh, you may not reach these levels immediately, but that um, use of your charging station will grow and eventually reach the, these levels. So you have, as you can see, two, two ways to, to change this. One is where you set the power level. You can keep it started out low until you get enough um, usage to ra raise it back up. Um, or you can, um, yeah, there's not much more that you, you can do, do than that, except hope that people start attending or using it, which they will. I mean, we have good, good usage now. So, I guess the, the big message for, for me about demand charges is that the economics are, are working against the people and businesses who, um, who can't take advantage of residential rates. It's really a matter of equity for those people who are living in apartments or affordable housing. If we expect them to get into EVs um, and take advantage of, of that lifestyle, we need some way to, to make it, it equal um, for them so that they don't have, have to pay a penalty. Um, and one, one way that I thought that this could be done is by um, changing the rules for, for demand. If we just expanded um, the free part from five to 50 kilowatts, that would open up a lot of char charging potential across the state. And I, and I think, um, well, you, you could fit four chargers operating at full power um, under that uh, 50 kilowatt cap. So that's where I'd like to spend a little bit of my advocacy now, is, is trying to get um, demand reduced, uh, demand uh, policies in, in place. So I've thrown out a whole bunch of um, graphs and charts and tables and things like that. If anyone wants to, um, one, one minute? Okay. Um, I'm happy to, um, to help you generate the same kind of info. So, time for questions. I think just because of the, we'll yeah. save the other
for the sake of time, and obviously these folks are here and are going to be here, I'm gonna say if we don't get a chance to ask questions of them to please connect with them um, on the side, but I do wanna keep our program moving. So um, thank you guys so much. I mean, I think this exemplifies teamwork and how it takes a village to get a project like this off the ground. So um, kudos to you guys for the, a great project. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Up next, I'd like to invite Dan Shanahan of EVSC LLC, an EV charging company located here in New England. Um, he is the Director of Sales and Marketing, and I'll let you introduce yourself as I get your presentation loaded. Hey, hi everybody, I'm Danny, I'm Danny Shanahan, I'm the uh, Marketing and Sales Director for EDSC LLC in Enfield, Connecticut, where we manufacture the car chargers and have so since 2009. Can you hear me okay? There we go. And uh, so I, I want to go over uh, some essentials about charging stations uh, that we manufacture and some sites that we've got that you can see. So we were founded in 1969. We're a Connecticut manufacturer since 1963. And uh, so, uh, and we started our charging station business in 2009. Uh, we have a time management, we make employee time clocks that are all over the world. And we also in install fleet management systems at all the rental car companies at airports are tracking uh, millions of cars, tens of millions of gallons of fuel for the rental car companies every day. Um, and we're probably part of this Connecticut River Valley history of invention and innovation. Uh, we have a market segment that really covers all those locations where charging stations are being focused. And uh, we just recently did a great project with Brian DeShays at Wolf Bar. was great working with him. And uh, we have the National Mall, the U.S. Navy, a lot, of, a lot of installations in state, federal, and local levels. And uh, at Antioch University has got our charger installed. I think it was shipped in 2013, and it's been operating since 2014, and it's... Still working. <laughs> okay. Um, there we go. So we have about 5,000 chargers installed across the U.S. and over about seven to 800 in New England. Um, when we first started de designing charging stations, we're a New England manufacturer, so we looked at some of the challenges and mu much of what we saw in terms of designing the chargers were cables on the ground. And uh, there are obstacles for pedestrians uh, and they also uh, they're an obstacle in the pathway for persons with disabilities. And so we really researched the ADA um, document uh, published by the Department of Justice. It's a civil right, not a, uh, a zoning law. Um, this is equal accessibility for, for everybody. And so we designed chargers that would avoid these kind of challenges. Um, our charging station product line, all except one, have, have what we call cable management. The cable is kept inside the charger until it is activated. It's kept off the ground away from snow plows. It's not in the pathway of anybody who's, um, whether that's an EV driver or uh, a pedestrian. And uh, it's a 20 foot cable it re it, and, and it goes out to all of the receptacles on the EV uh, uh, the electric vehicle, whether it's on a, a tail light end of the vehicle or in the front of the vehicle. Um, the two models to the right uh, are designed specifically for utility poles or uh, metal light poles, LED light poles. Uh, this is a breakthrough in electric vehicle charging station infrastructure. We started deploying this out in Los Angeles. We've got 500 of them across the city. And um, there was a lot of vandalism out in, out in California in that area. And um, so these are being deployed, and it eliminates 80% of the installation because you don't need any saw cutting, trenching, wiring, and backfilling, etc. We're taking power right off the pole. These are level two chargers, um, and um, we're working with major utilities all across the country, uh, and this, there's a lot of excitement about this. It speeds up delivery and eliminates a lot of uh, 
resistance in terms of deploying. These can be used also where, for multi-unit dwellings where there's no off-street parking. Because we can use, um, especially in those city areas and locations where there, isn't any, there aren't any garages, et cetera, with uh, communication capability, this is all uh, wireless. Uh, the ceiling mount is, um, uh, we just actually had some photographs of installations down in Florida where these were not being touched by the floodwaters. They were uh, in garages where they were off the ground. The cable comes down from the ceiling. We have these along um, shorelines and in flood areas in other parts of the country as well. These are all level two chargers. We have these at uh, one of the largest installations at MGM Springfield Casino. Um, so this is Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. We have most of the state agencies using our chargers in, in Connecticut. And uh, these are dual pole chargers and as you can see, the cables are 20 feet long, and uh, the, the, this is at the headquarters right around the corner from the Capitol. And they can be activated by an RFID card, a credit card, a key fob, an on-button activation, or a live operator. Uh, this is uh, Antioch, New England. This is our first installation uh, in New Hampshire, and it was actually, we shipped it in 2013, it was installed in 2014, it's our generation one single charger, it's still operating, it's uh, operating on the old uh, clutch, drive, sling, pulley kind of assembly that we had back then, but uh, they're very happy, and um, we're talking to them about uh, upgrading, but they, they've been using, and th the benefit of it, obviously, is that it, it's kept out of the snow and the cable stays off the ground, level two charger. Uh, this is, uh, recently it was mentioned that ISO New England uh, predicted, um, Jessica mentioned this, about a million um, EVs uh, on the road in, in the next uh, few years. Uh, ISO New England and Holyoke headquarters has been our customer for the past four years. They have 20 chargers there and in uh, their Windsor, Windsor facility. It's a major federally regulated facility. Um, and they're very happy with these chargers. These are dual chargers, and there's uh, three payment stations serving uh, the 20 chargers there. And those are for employees. This is Mass Mutual. They actually have 30 chargers there for their employees. These are all wall mounts. They're single, and they have all the same capabilities of the other chargers. These all can be networked so that you can monitor the chargers, you can scale back load like you were uh, suggesting to avoid demand charges. And uh, this is another uh, location for a community college down in Connecticut. These are singles, we have these in dual mode. They're monitoring um, their uh, charger activity regularly uh, and they're they're working fine. Those have been installed for the past four or five years. These are the ceiling mounted chargers at, at MGM Casino. They're also used widely by UConn all across their five cam campuses. And uh, it's activated by, it's for free use. They're just adding payment to it now. And uh, cable comes down, they plug it into the vehicle and it goes back up into the housing. What's really important about a ceiling mounted charger and the only ones who have it and it's patented is that you save thousands per installation because you don't have all the extra wiring, bollards, bumper, bumper stops, etc. And you can save thousands per installation if you have a garage. Um, networking is, is a common question. How do we pay? Uh, so one of the common questions that comes up in the EV, EV world is how do we charge for usage? Well, you've got to have a charging station that's connected to the network. Just like it's, it's, it's a point of sale device and capability just like at your supermarket or CVS. And uh, so we network the chargers, we communicate with them wirelessly and we transmit and receive signals from the credit card processing company or the network provider and they turn on the charger once the card gets validated. It's no different really than your point of sale operations that you use every day at the gas station and elsewhere. Um, the network that uh, we attach to is, is based on a standard, um, it's called Open Charge Point Protocol. It's a de facto, not an actual standard for network management and control. But the, um, the screens that uh, Peterborough was presenting earlier were examples of that kind of data that you want to monitor 
uh, and be aware of and get your hands on and learn how to log in and use that software because it'll uh, keep you posted on how much you're spending on electricity, how much revenue, and how much carbon footprint you're actually reducing. That's an important uh, data uh, cap there. Some of the, the quick questions that come up are, how long does it take to charge an EV? Well, that's really dependent upon the size of your battery. Let's say you've got a 100-mile battery, um, and you've got a 9.6 kilowatt charger. Well, that's going to add about 35 miles of driving range to the battery per hour. So you, you can possibly get there in three and a half to four hours uh, off a 50 amp breaker at 9.6 kilowatts. So can we, can we charge EV drivers for use of the charger? Absolutely. The, early on, nobody was doing this because there, wasn't, there weren't a lot of networks available. And, um, and also, it was, there were a lot of grants being given out, and especially in Connecticut, they didn't want customers to be scared off by a fee. They didn't want to put any obstacles in the pathway to adopting chargers or electric vehicles. So they gave it away for free. A lot of those municipal customers are coming back to us now adding credit card payment stations. Because too many uh, t selectmen are asking, why are we giving all away all this electricity? <laughs> um, it's a good conversation. Um, so uh, you can certainly do that. And if you use a, a, a model, uh, right now we're paying about 350 a gallon. For, for gas. And um, if you look at a, a charger at 9.6 kilowatts and you're adding 35, um, 35 gallons uh, per hour of charge, you can charge 350 plus your kilowatt charge uh, as a model to use. Uh, the price of the, the gas is obviously going up now and you have the right to change those prices just like a gas station. So you can use the, the model of um, what are we paying for gas now? How many miles do they get on that gallon of gas? How many miles do they get on an hour of charging? And what kilowatt rate are we at? And you can come up with a formula that will keep you whole. Two minutes, Dan, okay. Um, who keeps the revenue? You do, and you should, unless you're hiring an operator to come in and own and operate everything and is paying for everything uh, and may offer some revenue sharing. Uh, but that's a more detailed kind of conversation but you should keep the revenue. It's your property, it's your chargers, and they're your customer. Uh, can we add fines for staying plugged in when it's full? Absolutely. The software will allow you to do that just like your parking software. If somebody is hogging a, a station uh, and they've been there all day when they charge for only three hours, other people should have the right to shop, stop, and plug in. Um, and if anything's go wrong, you can call us or our 24-7 live operator partners, uh, multilingual, that are available to help an EV driver, to, to help an installer, or to ask a question about if there's an issue with the charger, we're there to cover that for you. Um, and that's a well-established network of operators and technicians that we have nationwide. So I just, I'd just like to say one thing. I just want to say thanks to Clean Cities. Uh, and, um, and to Lee Granis, I don't know if you remember, Lee Granis was the Dean of Clean Cities who started with, with the organization with DOE in the 90s and uh, really started alternative fuel um, consciousness in the U.S. Department of Energy and has brought electric cars, LNG, alternative fuel vehicles, natural gas uh, to the playing field and I was just speaking with him the other day. So God bless USDOE and Clean Cities. And the other thing, just one last thing, is the conversation that we're having today and the advancement of electric vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure would not have happened without local governments. It wasn't the car manufacturers that drove this marketplace. It was the grassroots sustainability, energy committees, selectmen, DPWs that really raised this to the level of consciousness where it is today. So congratulate yourself. and. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. So thank, thank you, you, Jessica, for all this. And um, as she gets mine loaded, I'll tell you a little bit about me. My name's Brian Deshays. I'm a selectman in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. Um, and Wolfboro is a little bit different 
than other municipalities. We have, which one is it? Is this one? Okay, so we're a little bit different. We have tourism, we have um, people that come to visit. We've seen um, Teslas and EVs coming through and gaining in popularity year after year after year. Um, we also have our own municipal electric department. We have um, 14 cent uh, kilowatt rate in our town. Um, it's been fixed for about 16 years. Um, we also have a, a real difficult parking structure. Um, we've been told, I can look at old minutes from meetings in the 1800s, and in the 1800s, they were saying, the citizens were, there's not enough room to park our horses and carriages in downtown Wolfboro. <laughs> so today, you can see the picture on the right, that happens to be the first week in October. Okay, so we have the traffic, we have the people. We're a small community, there are only 6,300 people in, in town, but we swell to 20,000 during the summer months. Um, we had some champions also. Um, when I became a selectman, I was asked to join committees. I joined the energy committee um, with a, a great group of people who were instrumental in getting geothermal in our new high school, that are working on solar for our new library, that are looking at solar and um, efficiencies for our new skating rink. So there's, there's a lot of um, good people involved in renewables and energies. We also have people like the head of my DPW, when we brought him this project, said, um, so we're gonna give away free electricity, why don't we give away free gasoline also? Um, I had my head of my electric department said, I don't like electric cars, I don't hear them coming. <laughs> so there were some, some things that we had to, that we had some hurdles we had to jump. But um, we had a chamber of commerce that was very supportive. We had a town manager who was on the fence, but we managed to push over um, to, to get him on our side. Um, we, we knew that um, we had the right location. We knew people come to our town anyways, and we thought for sure if they saw that there were charges, that they would make it an, a, a, a natural step to come see us. Um, so that's about that. And our, pro, our project was completely different than Peter Bohr's. It completely organic. Um, our master plan says that um, we were supposed to be moving towards supporting electrification and um, promoting energy efficient travel in our community. So that was already designated in our master plan. Um, but um, we had challenges. So when I came on, they had a site location where they were gonna use a parking lot that was maybe half a mile to three quarters of a mile out of town. So we sat down and we started to rethink and we decided, hmm, there's going to be a lot that's going to be built by a new train museum that we were renovating that was very close to downtown. It was um, something that we had to approach the community and say, you're going to lose two parking spots. And um, the community agreed. We, we took it to a board of selectmen meeting, made it a, a public forum. Um, they, the, the public that showed up was okay with it. Um, we had the infrastructure being built. So again, like Peterborough, we could save money by um, having the, when the, when the lot was all torn up, running our conduits. And we um, installed just once uh, 3704 dual coil from EVSE. Um, and we, but we put the infrastructure in so that we can um, take and install a second dual port charger in two spots right next door. Um, and uh, we made sure that you can see, I don't know if you can see the little red star. The little red star in the middle is um, right behind our train museum building that they're in the process of, of renovating. And it gives you walking distance to the town docks, to all the shops, to all the stores in, in downtown. Um, and we knew that um, primarily people that, that drove electric cars wouldn't mind that short distance. Um, We needed to decide how to select equipment. Um, when, when I um, 
was put on to the um, Wolfboro Electric Committee, they had looked at four large companies. Um, they were looking at um, ChargePoint, Blink, um, I think there was SemiConnect, and, and some other large companies. Um, I brought to them the idea of let's look at some smaller companies. Um, and the, uh, the two ways to look at it is the large service companies will do everything from soup to nuts to you. They provide all the software, they provide the um, equipment, they can find you an installer. Um, but it can be very pricey. A smaller company where you buy the chargers, you buy them direct, you can lease some chargers, you can buy them, there's different ways to do it. Um, and then you get yourself a um, back office software company to run the software portion of it. Um, having an open platform like that, an open software platform, gives you the ability that if you want to change software providers because you don't like the service, you need to change rates, you have some flexibility. Um, I just recently called ChargePoint just to see, because they were one of our big gorillas we were looking at first. Um, to date, if we did two ChargePoint chargers, they would be $15,000 to $17,000. Our EVSE chargers, which I think has the most fantastic cable management system um, and offers um, more payment options, is still only about $8,400. And that's both systems having five years of um, software providing and um, communication services. Um, ChargePoint does offer a five-year warranty. EVSE gives us a three-year warranty. We're okay with that. Um, so those have worked, um, and, and it's worked very, very well for us. And so there's our lovely charges. They're right at the beginning of a walking trail, um, which we, we thought would be a good place, lots of visibility. Um, we took and um, we decided that to fund them, we, we needed a different way to do it. When Wolfboro has a lot of financial challenges right now, we need to completely rebuild our water systems, we need to completely rebuild our sewer systems. Um, we have the town docks that uh, we, we just spent um, three quarters of a million dollars renovating. We just have a lot of infrastructure for a small town. Um, we do have a decent amount of tax revenues and it helps. But so. We, we thought of there's three ways. You can use a Warren article, a town Warren article. You can ask the taxpayers for $35,000. That's what originally the Energy Committee wanted to do. Um, when I got on, I said, let's look at some different alternatives. So we started thinking about private donations or a partnership between the, um, the, the town of Wolfboro and the, the public. Um, so we ended up getting um, donations but from seven different businesses in town at $2,000 a piece. We raised $14,000. Um, then we partnered with um, the town and, and they did the um, infrastructure installation at no additional charge to the um, energy committee because they already had the lot up. That it was a matter of just some conduits and um, a breaker box. Um, and. Um, we, um, we have managed to um, charge 20 cents a kilowatt with our 14 cent a kilowatt cost. We end up with a 30% profit on revenues when we're done. And the town, the, the electric department has graciously waived our, our $5 demand fee or for, for that, because that's all you pay is $5 a month. So they've waived that. So um, in reality, and when we're getting our first month, we had about, um, I think, 60 charges. Our second month, 74. And this month, we're on pace to do about 50 again. Um, we're, uh, revenues, $200 a month is what we're pulling in. Um, so 30% of that is going into a, a, a fund account that we'll use in case we have repairs after the warranty runs out, or maybe we can um, put aside a, you know, a few thousand dollars to help with our next installation for our next two chargers. Um, so what we have doesn't work for everybody. Um, 
there's, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to run into, oh, that was my funding, I should have had that up already. Oh, excuse. Um, so, your equipment is not going to be what our equipment may be. You may um, find that it's best for your town. You have a budget for this already. Um, and you have the, the money where you can just put in $35,000 worth of chargers, three, four stations, whatnot. Um, Wolfboro's a small town, so we had to do it a little bit differently. Um, you need people to get the project over the finish line. Um, we had a subcommittee out of our energy committee that was fantastic. And um, I was on the subcommittee also. And it was, um, we had to keep driving and pushing. And we, yeah, we had pushback on Facebook, people saying, you're taking up our parking spots, you're giving away electricity, we had to do damage control, um, things like that. But um, with good, with good dedicated people like Peterborough had, you can get a project from beginning to end. Ours was, um, before I got on, 10 months of discussions and thinking, and then it took us um, about three or four months to actually dig in deep and get things done. We purchased the equipment um, last fall, and it was supposed to be installed this spring, but as projects go, it was behind, and it got in um, in July, and Jessica came up, came up for the ribbon cutting. Um, which, was, which was really, really nice of her. Um, and you have to also educate not only the public, but your town administrators. Snow removal, that's gonna be a problem. Vandalism, that's gonna be a problem. Who's gonna monitor the charges? Who's gonna be the community manager? That's me. Um, uh, where, where are the funds um, recorded? Um, we ended up finding out that um, for the first half a year, we're not gonna make any revenues because we had to open up a um, revolving fund that's gonna be voted on in a Warren article to put our profits in a separate account. So the town's making the money the first year, not the energy committee. It's all the same, but um, it, it, it's some of the revenues that we lose this year. Um, then there, then, then they, we ran into some, um, oh, I need to go back to one. How did we decide what charger to use? Okay, so 32 amp, 40 amp, 48 or 50 amp. The difference in, um, in uh, kilowatts is 7.7 .7 kilowatts, 9.6 kilowatts, 11.5 kilowatts. So how do you decide what you need? I looked at the um, hybrid, plug-in hybrid cars, what they can pull. I have a Volkswagen ID4, what it pulls, and an Ionic 5, what it pulls. I use those as kind of our, our scope. Um, so my Volkswagen and the Ionic 5 can pull 11 kilowatts, okay? So looking at the price of the chargers and what they pull, 7.7, .7 we said, a little bit slow. 9.6 gets us, for a little bit of money, gets us much closer to the 11. When you get up to the 48 or 50, you get 11.5, you have cars that can't take all the voltage that can be put out for them. So we went with the, the 40 amp, and it gives you, uh, we use 250 amp breakers. The other problem is if you go up to a 50, um, you have to use 260 um, breakers, and then you get into more expensive and heavier duty lines and your electric infrastructure has to be a little bit more robust. So we, that's where we found as our sweet spot. Um, we've had cars come from all over New England. We've had motorcycles now charging at the station. Um, the, uh, and I will say the only hiccup we've had, and I'm not, I'm not giving you a dig, Dan, <laughs> Whenever we've had a failure at our, at our station, it's because people don't read the two notes on the unit that say, push the button to get the, tr to get the plug out. And it, it, that's the kind of thing you can't fix. So I've gone down multiple, multiple times, and I, I've seen multiple failures at, at the same time on the unit, and I've driven my car down half a mile or a mile down the road, and I've swung in, I've said, are you having a problem? And they're like, yep. And a lot of times they, they go like this, they have the, the head hung in shame. I didn't read it. 
and now it's working okay. And I'm like, okay. So, um, but the, the charges have been fantastic. Um, we used a company called Amp Up, um, and Amp Up has been absolutely fantastic. When we've needed support, the installation was tricky. I would advise um, any community that installs these chargers, um, if your DPW or your regular department installs the main power, that's good. Hooking up the charger, find an electrician who, is, who can read a 20-page manual and think outside the box. Because we had a lot of challenges with the installation. Not EVSE's problem, not AMP UP's problem, our, our own electrician. We had pieces that were broken, things that didn't go together right, and I did a lot of um, tech support with Dan and with AMP UP, and I did a lot of the taking apart the unit and putting things together myself. Um, but again, it showed the support that I got from those two companies that they were on the phone with me for hours walking me through as I was dismantling and, and, and reinstalling pieces. Um, so I would say make sure you have an electrician that understands how to put a charger in. The last hurdle, signage. Whoop, we get to the end of the project. We're like, cars are gonna be parking where they're not supposed to be parking. Oh, you need to get a sign approved. You need to get an ordinance approved. Um, you have to decide um, how do you have people not park there. Um, we did do something that's very aggressive. We haven't had to use it yet. We have a, um, a $20 an hour um, fee if you stay there plugged in after you're done charging. Um, I was pushing for five dollars for an idle fee. My energy committee said um, someone that has a fifty thousand dollar car that comes from Connecticut when they're parking there if they're paying five dollars an hour they think that's cheap parking. So they, they, they I was outvoted and it was up to twenty dollars an hour for an idle fee. We haven't had to charge one yet. Um, so it, it, it's been good. And the, and the bottom um, sign was that we had to actually make a, an ordinance that aligns with our other town ordinances because um, you can say only four hour parking, but there's no way to enforce it. You can say four hour charging. Um, most people that have come to Wolfboro, and a lot of them have come now because they said, hey, you have chargers. They see it on PlugShare and they come and, and, and they use the charges and they really like it. Um, they stay anywhere from an hour to four hours. They go to our downtown. Um, the EVSE, here's something that I found was unusual. I talked to Dan about this. In California, they have a, they've passed a law that says that by a certain date, 2025 or something, anything after 2025 has to have a, pay, a credit card swipe or a credit card um, tap in order to pay. Well, we installed ours, and again, this is why we used EVSE, because they ended up having a credit card swipe option. Some companies do, some companies don't. It was a, a $1,200 upcharge, but it was worth every nickel, because 90 plus percent of our charges on our, our credit card swipes. I can see it on my dashboard. And because people are used to, you know, even new EV adopters are used to just using the credit card and the gas pumps. And um, some people download the apps, but most are just using the credit card swipe. Um, and that's probably the reason, you know, as California goes, so does the rest of the country. They're usually ahead of the curve. Um, so it, it's been a, a fantastic experience. It was a lot of challenges. Um, we did not have the resources that Peterborough had. Um, we didn't have the support from our DPW and our electric department the way it is. The, our energy committee did it as a little ad hoc subcommittee, and, um, but we pushed through, and we had lots of support from people out of town. Um, but now, as we've seen what's happening, the whole community has changed with their opinion of the chargers. I had to speak at select board meetings and say, hey, guess what? We made $100 this month. And people are like, oh, interesting. And your parking is still OK. We only lost two spots. So it's been a great experience. And we're ready probably in the next year or two to expand to two more spots. 
So if anybody wants to come up to Wolfboro, see it, um, have a cup of coffee, or call me, um, go onto the website, my uh, private cell phone number, my private email address, and my town email address are on our uh, website, or just ask Amy at the town hall for Brian's information. Um, six in the morning till midnight. That's it. After midnight, I go to bed. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, before I let you all go, I just want to once again thank our fabulous presenters. I think hopefully today you've, you've learned that there are some steps that need to be thought through, but that you've got, you can rely on teams of people within your community and your energy committees to band together and, and persevere. And you've got connections now to some other communities that have forged ahead um, that you can rely on. So before you go, there is gonna be an electric vehicle ride and drive or just peruse them if you're nervous about them outside of the registration area door. So please do come and check out. There's gonna be a Ford F-150 Lightning pickup out there, a cargo van. We've got a bunch of different Lovering Volvos bringing an XC40. Um, we've got a lot of different electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles out there. And thank you to the New Hampshire Auto Dealers Association, Dan Bennett, I see you back there, for always supporting our outreach to dealers to get vehicles here and to also our wonderful EV owners. Um, um, I hope you guys have some great ideas now for moving forward within your communities. And as you know, Clean Cities is here as a resource. We love to network and connect. Take advantage of the fact that these folks are here. You know, talk with them, ask questions, and wish you the best in moving your community forward. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.